Hello, welcome, welcome everybody. Um, apologies for the two minutes late, um, but we're live now. We're live in Zoom. We're live in YouTube. Um, so wherever you're following us, welcome. Um, feel free to say hi in the chat. We'll we'll wait like a few more seconds for people to to roll in. So feel free to say hi. Say where you're joining from. Um, and um, just a little bit of the usual housekeeping rules. So this uh, is being recorded. So don't go to crazy on note taking or anything. We'll send you the we'll send you the um, recording tomorrow um, alongside Nathan's um, slides. Any useful links that he will share with you. Um, and then of course, Nathan, I just tagged you um, is in the um, platform engineering Slack. Um, so if we don't get to all the questions today and you have any follow-ups, feel free to uh, find them there. Um, yeah, last thing I will say, um, you uh, the 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 ideal way of, and I don't understand why my chat functionality is broken right now. Um, yeah, all right, now I can see it. So um, if you're using the chat, please use the to everyone so that everyone can see your questions or, or your comments. Um, and ideally, if you have questions, use the Q&A feature, because then um, we can queue them and um, people cannot vote them. That's always the best, especially since we're already over 80 people. So um, Nathan, I think the crowd is ready for you. So I'll shut up, disappear, and the stage is yours. Okay. Thank you for having me. And this is a topic that I'm obviously passionate about. And I talk a bit about quite a lot. And what we're talking about is Kubernetes CPU limits and why it's an anti-pattern. And this is obviously very opinionated, but I will do my best to back up with data and show you why this is the case and to take questions and uh, hear if anyone disagrees and to try and address those concerns. So just to get started, so I am uh, the CEO and co-founder of Robusta.dev. I've been an engineer for almost all of my career. And what we do at Robusta is we take your alerts and we tell you why they happen and try and give you good default alerts for uh, Kubernetes. And it's powered by Prometheus and so on. And I'm not gonna speak about any of this today. I'm only bringing it up because we take alerts and for a living, I have to tell people what those alerts mean and how to fix them. So very rapidly, you get pulled into everything related to resources. A whole lot of uh, alerts that people have on Kubernetes are related to resources, related to CPU throttling. So to even start to give people advice and especially automated advice for how to fix their alerts, then you have to really understand Kubernetes resource management. So that's why I got pulled in to this entire topic and why I've dealt with it a lot more than I ever thought I was. Okay, so moving on, we're going to cover a few different topics. First up, the real bare basics of Kubernetes scheduling, just a quick reminder for people who aren't super familiar with it, how it works. Then we're going to speak a little bit about CPU requests because you can't discuss CPU limits without understanding requests first. Then I'm going to make the case that CPU limits are actually not what you want to use and they're actually harmful and that you don't need them all together. And that'll be easy to do after I've spoken about requests. Finally, I'm going to speak about best practices and misconceptions. I'm going to give you the bottom line, what you should do, when you should re remove requests, when they are still relevant. And lastly, I'm going to stop and take questions, but please also submit questions throughout uh, this, throughout this uh, webinar. I have the chat open on another window. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at the Q&A. Uh, thank you to everyone who's diving in from all over the world. It's uh, nice to see all of you. So please ask questions, feel free. And I also like to see people also commenting. So I feel like I'm not just talking to a wall. So please feel free to comment. And I, I'm looking at that as I go along. Okay, so let's jump right into it. So fundamentally scheduling on Kubernetes is the problem of taking a bunch of pods, which have containers inside of them, and putting them on nodes. As we're about to see, that's actually a very hard and annoying problem. It looks like it's the most trivial thing in the world. You have a bunch of pods, you have a bunch of nodes, you stick some pods on nodes. Turns out that's an incredibly hard thing to do, and especially hard to do on Kubernetes. So I want to look at why that's fundamentally a hard problem. And there are five sort of physical constraints here, which make this a hard problem. Kubernetes scheduling is hard, first and foremost, because moving pods between expensive, uh, sorry, moving pods between nodes is expensive. And what I mean by that is you have a pod, you schedule that to some node running somewhere, and if you made the mis a mistake and you put it on the wrong pod, or you put in a pod that doesn't have enough resources, then you can't instantly take that pod and 
teleport it to somewhere else and then have everything keep on running. Instead, you have to bring that pod down and there are people who have open connections to it. So you have to wait until those connections disappear. You have to start up a new pod that replaces it on a different node and there's some startup time. So it's expensive to move pods between nodes. So what that means is that you have to figure out in advance which node the pod should run on. And that is a very hard thing to do. And that's a hard thing to do because number two, nodes have finite amounts of CPU and it doesn't change. So let's say you have a node, that node is just a virtual machine you're running in the cloud. And let's say it has two CPUs or two virtual CPUs. And then let's say you put a whole lot of pods on there. You put too many pods on, they're all doing lots of stuff and they're all using up the CPU. Well, you can't change that node now and retroactively give it four CPUs and just update it. All you can do is you can bring up another node and then you can start moving everything around. That makes a big mess. So third, pods use changing amounts of CPU. So this is like the opposite of the previous one. So we have a resource here, nodes, that have a finite set amount of CPU. And then we're trying to take pods and the amount of CPU that they use changes all the time. And we're trying to fit them into something, into a box that only has a set amount of capacity. So fundamentally, it's a hard problem because you have a node that only has a certain amount of capacity and you have pods that sometimes use a lot, sometimes use a little. So it's, you're never going to hit quite that sweet spot. So we'll look a little bit at more later at that and what it means in terms of overutilization and underutilization. Fourth, scheduling fundamentally requires guessing about the future. No one can predict the future. And it requires guessing about the future because of all these items here. Because it's expensive to move pods between nodes, because nodes have limited resources, because the amount of pot resources that pods use up changes all the time. So fundamentally what this means is that we have to take a pod we have to guess how much CPU it's going to use later on. We have to pick a node. We have to kind of guess how much CPU other pods on that node are, know that are going to use in the future. And then we have to say, okay, is this the right place to run this? Will it actually get enough CPU there? So fundamentally, this is a hard problem. And finally, if you get all this wrong, we haven't even spoke about requests or limits yet. When you get stuff wrong, then fundamentally you've taken too many resources or too many pods and you put it in a place that doesn't have enough resources. So someone is going to want CPU and not get it. Or you err in the opposite what direction, and then there's all this extra capacity that's underused and it's not used and you're paying for too much. But fundamentally, scheduling in general is a hard problem, especially because of each of these constraints. Scheduling on Kubernetes is a hard problem. So the fundamental dilemma that you will always deal with, no matter how you schedule in general, is you have to choose between overutilization and underutilization. And if you overutilize, that means you're packing in stuff really tight and you're overutilizing that node. So it's more efficient. You never have just CPUs sitting around there doing nothing. It's cheaper. But then when suddenly there's stress or there's a spike, then suddenly there isn't enough CPU to go around. And on the opposite side, if you underutilize and you pack in your uh, pods with lots of extra space in between them, you get them more space than you need, then it's more reliable, but it's more expensive. And if you take this to the extreme, like the best way that you could run Kubernetes, where everyone would always have enough resources, every pod that comes along, give it a massive node with like 64 uh, CPUs and give it uh, terabytes of memory. So like, obviously if you do that, then every pod always has enough memory and you never have issues with resources, but it's terribly, terribly inefficient and expensive. So everyone will be somewhere in between these two. And you also have to decide, depending on your application, where you're going to fit in on the spectrum. Let's say you have an application that uh, does some batch processing overnight. Let's say you have a bank and that night you like crunch all the transactions for that day and create some report. So it's a super important report, but it doesn't really matter if it runs all night or if it runs half the night, as long as it's ready by the morning. So maybe in that case, it's okay to over utilize. And then if too much stuff is going on, it takes double the amount of time to run, but no one cares. So really it depends here on your application. And uh, I'll stop for a second. If there are any questions so far, anything that people ask in the chat, then I'll try and address that. Um, so I'm just gonna pause for just a moment. Okay, I don't see any And questions. I know Nathan that we also had like a couple of polls, just let me know at what point you wanna launch them. Okay, so we're gonna launch the next poll uh, very soon and mm -hmm. I'll tell you why. All right. uh, and thank you for the comment, uh, Thomas. Okay, so the way that Kubernetes handles this is Kubernetes has two fundamental concepts that it uses to take this mass, to take this fundamental complexity, and to make it manageable. 
And those two ways are requests and limits. And the request is an estimate of how much CPU this pod will use. And the limit is an upper limit on what we are actually going to let that pod use. And now before we go on, I want to bring up the first call on what requests actually do, like what requests actually mean. So we've said it's an estimate of how much CPU is going to be used, but what will those actually do? So can we bring up the first poll here? Should be live now. Yep. Okay. So the question is, what are CPU requests used for? And I've said here that they're an estimate of how much it's going to use, but what does that actually mean? Are they used for scheduling pods to nodes and only used at scheduling time? Are they used to guarantee at runtime that pods get a minimum amount of CPU? Is it both of the above or none of the above? And this question, even though it's about CPU requests, this fundamental question, which don't worry if you get it wrong, the vast majority of people get it wrong. This question is why people misunderstand limits. I know we're speaking about requests, but because this question about requests is misunderstood, people get limits totally wrong. And I see there's a question also in the Q&A about how to find the balance between the two, between requests and limits, and we're going to touch on that later on. Yeah. Okay, so I see the audience has actually uh, done a very decent job, and 57% said that CPU requests are used for both, and that is correct, and that's far more a far higher percentage of the correct answer than uh, most people get. And we're going to walk through this now, and we're going to show the data and how it actually works. Okay, so the way that Kubernetes uses requests is that every node has a certain capacity, and think of that capacity as those buckets that appear there on the left. So a node has a certain amount of CPU that you can that it has available, and we're going to assign that CPU to different people. So along comes a pod, and we look at all the different nodes, and we look at that pod's request, and then we assign it to a specific node. So let's say we have a node that has two CPUs available. That's the capacity. And then along comes a pod that needs half a CPU. So we take that pod, we assign it to that node, and we subtract that half a CPU, which is the request, we subtract that from the node's capacity. So the node had two CPUs available. Now it has 1.5 CPUs available because we've assigned half a CPU to that pod. And that half a CPU is defined according to that pod's request. And along comes another pod that requests, let's say, two CPUs. We can't assign it to that first node. That node has remaining capacity of 1.5 CPUs. That new pod, it needs two whole CPUs. So it can't go on that node. It will have to go on another node. And if there aren't enough nodes available, then the cluster auto scaler will have to assign more nodes. And if that's not possible, the pod is just going to sit in pending. And the fundamental part, the key thing is Kubernetes never schedules more requests to a node than the capacity. So whenever you add up all the requests that are on a given node, it will never be more than the amount of CPU that that node has available. So a request is used to determine like how we're splitting up a node's resources, and you will never have more pods running on a node than the total capacity uh, for that node, or then like, the total request will add up to more than the capacity. So in other words, no node is ever over allocated. You cannot over allocate a node from a request perspective, but this has a big implication. This means that runtime, you can actually enforce that. And at runtime, you can give each pod exactly what it requested, because when you did the scheduling, you schedule them correctly. So the way to think about this is each pod, it can actually get at runtime the request that it requested. And it's guaranteed that because you never double booked. The node never gave the same CPU to two people at once. It always reserved a certain amount of CPU. And it always gave that to a single person, like that unit of CPU. So when runtime happens, when you're now giving people the runtime, you're like distributing CPU live, then you can actually give everyone exactly what they requested. So that's what requests do. And um, it, requests are really both used for scheduling, but afterwards at runtime as well. And one last comment here is that each node also has CPU reserved for the system itself. Um, it, so let's say you have a pod, uh, sorry, a node with two CPUs, that whole two CPU, it won't actually be handed out um, to all the pods. Typically part of that CPU is reserved for Kubelet and for different stuff in Kube system and for the node itself. 
So let's say you have a node with two CPU, probably only something like 1.5 CPUs are actually available. So you will only hand out requests for 1.5 CPUs, not for the full two. Now I see there are another two questions here. And the first question is, where is the CPU status for each node stored in the control plane at CD or is requested to each node when required? So all this is happening locally on the node. When you did those allocations, you did the scheduling and you took stuff and um, you looked at the request and you assigned to notes, all that happened with that CD and like that scheduling decision was a global scheduling decision. But afterwards, when it's actually running there on the node, and it has to do with Linux and C groups and like lower level stuff. Um, so what you're storing in that CD is just how much like of them, you're storing the sum of all the different requests. And then you know from that to figure out how much is remaining. Okay, so the other question is, if I reserve some CPUs to kubelet the allocation changes, my understanding is those reserved CPUs would still be used to satisfy the limits. So you essentially, when you assign those and they're set aside, they're not used for any of the pods. Uh, they don't get taken, they're, they're kind of off limits. So they're not used afterwards for, this, for the pods that have requests on that node. I hope that answers the question. Okay, so what happens? So we scheduled, we did all this work. We looked at the request. We looked at how much is available on different nodes. And we did all that scheduling. So far, we haven't spoken at all about them. So, so far, forget there are limits. We're just assuming there are no limits, no limits involved in any of this story. And when we scheduled, see, there's also a question about this in the chat. When we schedule, we only looked at requests. When you schedule, you ignore limits. Limits have no impact in scheduling. So now we finished that scheduling. And now one of three situations happened. Either we scheduled perfectly, like the requests were all accurate. They represent an amount of CPU that the pods are actually going to use at runtime. So we did it all perfectly. Everything is perfect. You requested half a CPU. You're using that half a CPU. Someone else requested a whole CPU. They're using that whole CPU. Everything is fantastic. Second scenario, the requests were higher than they should have been. So a pod came, it requested half a CPU. And when it requested that half CPU, then it didn't actually use that half CPU at runtime. So when that's the situation, then you allocated that CPU, you saved it for that specific pod. It wasn't actually used by that pod. So it's a little wasteful because no one else was scheduled there who could have been scheduled there, who could have used that CPU, but nothing, Nothing terrible happened. It's not the end of the world. And the third scenario here is if requests are too low. So if the requests were too low, then you requested, let's say, half a CPU, and really you need a whole CPU. So you'll put in a node that doesn't have enough CPU saved aside for you. So you're guaranteed the half CPU, but you're not guaranteed to get that full CPU. Maybe that CPU is available because someone else there requested something that's too high, so you'll be able to use it anyway. Maybe not, but it's not guaranteed for you. Now, I see there's another question here. Will the scheduler assign a pod to a node, which has enough resources to refill the request, uh, but not the limit? And uh, the answer for that is no. When you, sorry, the answer for that is yes. When you do the scheduling, then you just look at the request. You don't look at the limits altogether. Limits are just totally ignored. And I apologize a little bit about the background noise. I'm working out of a WeWork. So there is some noise here that's not under my control. Um, okay, so moving on out to the first big misconception, uh, the first big misconception, which actually 57% uh, of the people here got this correct in the previous poll. Um, it, so the vast majority actually did not have this misconception, but a big misconception that we see a lot is that requests are only used for scheduling, and that's not true. And, um, and just to show this from the documentation, then in the Kubernetes documentation, here's a quote, pods are guaranteed to get the amount of CPU they request. So the request is used at scheduling time, but also at runtime. They may or may not get additional CPU time. Then there's other stuff about containers versus pods, and it's not really very interesting. And then the second part here that's interesting is excess CPU resources will be distributed based on the amount of CPU requested. So let's say there's extra CPU, and maybe someone requested CPU, but they're not actually using it. Someone else needs that extra CPU. So it's handed out to whoever needs it. And Let's say, suppose I'm reading again, container A requests 600 milli CPUs and B requests 300 milli CPUs. In both containers, they're just trying to use as much CPU as they can. So they were both just in an infinite loop trying to burn CPU. 
So there's an extra 100 millisecond, uh, milli CPU. So it's distributed to A and B in a two to one ratio because A requested 600, B had a request of 300. So the more you requested, the more you're going to get of access CPU. And that does, that does really seem fair. So it's a reasonable approach. Okay, so now again, imagine just to sum this up, we have a world and we have no limits. No one is assigning any limits to their pods. Then the way you should work is you just try to make requests correct and you don't need to sweat it too much. Let's say you have one request that's 500 um, milli CPU and it should be 600 milli CPU. Well, okay, maybe you have another request that's 700 and it really should be 600. You try and make mostly, mostly make things accurate. No one has limits, um, it, but on average, you're mostly accurate. So if you do that, everything will be totally fine. In the short term, sometimes you need a little bit of extra CPU, but probably someone else isn't exactly using the CPU at the exact moment. Let's say you're running on a node that has 10 pods. Well, where are the odds that exactly at the moment that you need extra CPU, someone at all the other nine pods are also using their full capacity and they also need extra CPU. It's possible if there's a spike. Um, so it's possible it can happen, but it's not gonna happen all the time. And even if it does happen in the worst case scenario, so short term, there's a small short term issue, and then you're probably doing all those scaling anyway. So you scale up some more pods, you scale up some more nodes, and it will all work out. There's no major damage done here. So if no one has limits and everyone has requests that are approximately right, and it's actually okay if they're too high, they just shouldn't be too low, but everyone has stuff that's approximately right, everything just works out fine. There's no issue, no major CPU throttling, everything is fine, and whatever isn't working out short term, the cluster auto scaler kicks in and it'll fix it very fast. And you're not going to see major CPU throttling issues. If the requests are mostly accurate, then you're not going to see major issues um, with, um, you're not going to see major issues like with over allocation because they're mostly accurate. So everything will be totally fine. And I wanna address two questions there that just came in, which are both on the exact same topic. What is the best way to calculate CPU required for a pod? Is there any open source tool for this? And it's definitely a popular question. The second question uh, from Carlos, what's the best way to estimate your requests? Um, so there are a few different ways you can do it uh, with, like with the VPA in uh, recommendation mode, the vertical pod auto scaler. Um, you can do it with, um, there's like, you can just look at a graphing Grafana, this is what a lot of people do, and then you like take the average over the past week. Um, at robusta.dev, um, which I work on, then we're working on some open source tooling for this too. Um, and we're doing that also in the context of alerting. So we want to be able to give you a notification saying like, oh, your request is off for the past week or the past month. We still don't have that in GA yet. So if someone's interested in that, like, please reach out. And I'd be happy to discuss um, the details on that. But um, typically the tools that you would go to is like either use something like the VPA, the vertical pod auto scaler, or you would um, look in Grafana and just like average it yourself. And then I see there's also a recommendation here, use Goldilocks uh, for monitoring um, and recommending requests. Um, I've heard of Goldilocks a lot. I, I haven't used it myself, but it probably is a good re uh, recommendation too. I just haven't used it. So there are a few more questions here in the comments. Um, let me take a quick glance and see if we're gonna address those now. Um, yeah, okay, so I'm only going to address one of the questions now and the other ones I'm going to address later. So if Genny asks, so the noisy neighbor problem doesn't apply if we set CPU requests only, correct? And that's an excellent question. And essentially the noisy neighbor question is what happens if you have one pod that's using up a ton of CPU and interferes with other pods? And let's jump right into that now, actually. I have a slide uh, just about that. And that's the next slide. So let's say you have two pods pod A and pod B, and they're both running on the same node. And pod A is using up a ton of CPU. It's using up more CPU than you anticipated. And pod A, it's like a stupid workload. You don't care about it. Something you don't care. Some uh, developer pushed like some test workload. Like I can speak poorly about developers because I was a developer my whole life, but like a developer does a developer thing. And the developer thing is to like push something up to production that like burns the CPU and it's like for some workload that doesn't even matter. Like you're messing up all the real production things. So pod A is some pod that's doing all this awful stuff and you don't even care about it. And no one in the company cares about it. it has no business impact. So we don't even care about pod A, but it's using up all the CPU. And now pod B, it doesn't get the CPU it needs. So the question is, how can we fix this? And what is the correct way to fix it? And uh, Luca, can we bring up the second poll right now? <laughs> 
Yep. Uh, let me, <clears throat> me launch it. It's launched. You should be able to see it. Okay, so the two choices are, do we give a limit for pod A? We say pod A is using up CPU. That's taking away CPU that pod need, B needs. So we'll give pod A a limit. Or do we just increase pod B's request? So that's the question. And I'm forcing you to choose between the two of them. One of these is the correct answer and one of these is the wrong answer. And you can probably guess like based on the title of this webinar, but I mean, give the honest answer you think based on what I've said so far. Okay, so yeah, I see. So 37% uh, said that we should add a limit for pod A and 63% said that we should increase pods, pod B's request. And uh, that is the correct answer. You should increase it for pod B. And now I'm going to walk through why and why adding it, limiting pod A is actually a, a bad choice here. So the scenario here where people think that they need to add a limit for pod A is that um, it, pod A is using up all that CPU, pod B doesn't get the CPU, and then they add a limit to A. And the problem with this is that you haven't fixed the fundamental problem. You've added a Band-Aid onto it, and you've now pre prevented A from using up extra CPU, um, but you haven't actually fixed the problem. The problem is that the real problem is that B has the wrong request. So let's say A stops running and Kubernetes will go and will replace A with other stuff that uses up the same amount of CPU. Um, Kubernetes will go and they'll pack in other pods on that node, even if A isn't running anymore. B, if B has the wrong request, then B is not guaranteed to get that amount of CPU no matter what. It doesn't have anything to do with pod A. Like pod B is only guaranteed to get the amount of CPU that it requests. If pod B isn't getting enough CPU, that means that the request is wrong because pod B will always get the amount of CPU in the request. And let's say you, again, add the limit for pod A, okay, it'll help right now when pod A is running on the same node, but pod A goes off the node, some other pods come on there and they just use up exactly their request and they do everything properly. Pod B is still in trouble because pod B has a bad request. If pod B requested too little CPU, other people can come and take it. So by solving this problem, by going and by putting a limit on A, you're not solving the root problem. The root problem here is that pod B doesn't get enough CPU. And the issue with limits in general is that when you use limits, there are actually a whole bunch of other big major downsides that have to do with increasing latency and P99 latency and other stuff that we're, we'll get into in just a moment. So the real way to fix this is again, to either increase the request for pod B, pod B is now guaranteed to get the CPU that it needs. And maybe pod A can't run on that node anymore because pod B is using up the correct amount. So pod A will go somewhere else in the cluster and no one cares. And there are very specific scenarios where maybe then it's are useful. I'm going to touch on that as well later on. Um, and there's a question here in the chat, does the vertical pod auto scaler and GKE help better determining the CPU request? And the answer is yes, uh, the VPA can do exactly that. And Goldilocks was recommended. And um, like I said earlier, you can also just look at Grafana and like, take the average over the past week and you can do different stuff like that. Okay, so moving on now. Let's look at a few other misconceptions why people think they need CPU limits. Number one reason why people think they need CPU limits is someone says to me, okay, I didn't have limits on my cluster. And my cluster died. The node started going down and there were all these issues and it stopped and my node stopped responding. And then all the pods that were running on that node went kaput. And everyone knows a story where this happened where they saw it happen themselves. The problem is it's never actually due to CPU limits. I've looked at a number of cases like this and it's never because of CPU limits. Maybe you didn't um, have enough node reserved. If you remember earlier, then like you reserve a certain amount of stuff for the node itself. And even if you didn't have limits, like, sorry, even if you had limits on anything, on everything, like if you don't have enough node reserved, then when the node, node is full, you're going to be in trouble no matter what. And sometimes the issue here has to do with memory. With memory, then if you get too high with memory utilization, then there are other issues that you happen where you start seeing disk thrashing and the live disk swapping and everything like slows to crawl and it typically kills the node. I've seen that happen a few times, especially on EKS. And uh, had, the, had the happy few days to try and debug that. It's a very painful and annoying issue. Um, and I can tell you in all these cases, 
at first glance, there were people who were certain that the issue here was that there were no limits. At a deeper glance, it didn't have to do with limits. Sometimes adding limits kind of fixed or patched part of the problem, but it wasn't the real root cause. And by not fixing the root cause and by just putting on that Band-Aid, the problem came back at a later point in time. Uh, me. Okay, so the other misconception is a pod was throttled, so I need limits, and this is the quite the opposite. So again, when pod is throttled, it means that pod's request is too small, so you should update the request. It has nothing to do with limits. Um, the correct way to fix this is not to add limits in other pods, it's to increase the request on the pod that was throttled. Um, it's nice people say you should add limits because it's a best practice. I'm going to debunk that a little bit later on by bringing quotes from Kubernetes maintainers. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of blog spam out there and a lot of um, companies that have done like a lot of SEO work to try and get like great blog posts out there that are number one in Google and they've done a lot of good SEO work, but the content isn't actually good quality content. So it'll say it's the best practice, but it's actually not. So you have to look at who is writing that and whether it's a reliable source. And uh, lastly, a lot of times you hear about CPU throttling that's due with the kernel bug in CFS and the completely fair scheduler. There was a kernel bug once that had an impact on throttling and limits and very specifically had an impact on Kubernetes. There was a kernel bug like that. It was fixed a long time ago. So it doesn't have anything to do with most of the issues that you see today. Okay, before we move on, I want to stop again and address a few questions that have come up. So there's a question here. Does Kubernetes kill a pod if it uses more than its limit, but there are still resources um, for all the other pods running there and for their requests? Um, the short answer is it's complicated, um, and I don't feel comfortable enough giving like a definitive answer with the, about this without digging into the documentation. One of the surprising things about unkills in general um, is that, OK, sorry, I jumped a step forward. So with regarding CPU, no one will ever be killed, period. When it comes to CPU, no pod ever gets killed because it uses more than the CPU limit. It just gets limited. So it can't use more CPU, and it gets throttled. And regarding memory, then um kills actually don't happen instantly, but I don't want to get into that just yet. Um, but in general, if a pod goes over its CPU limit, then you will be throttled. Being CPU throttled means that you just don't get to use um, it, the CPU, and like you have to wait around, and you can't use the CPU right now. But you will never be killed if you try and use up too much CPU. OK, so moving on, um, I see also there's a question about memory. I'm going to touch on memory later, so I'm deliberately waiting on that question for now. OK, moving on. The big misconception number two is that limits do no harm as long as your limits are high enough. So let's say you have a pod that's using one CPU, and you make your limit two. Then people will say to me, oh, Natan, like, OK, I shouldn't have limits. But my limit is so high anyway. Surely it's not going to have a negative impact because I'm not actually reaching that limit. And this is totally, totally wrong. And it's very unintuitive, but I'm going to try and illustrate why with a diagram. So let's say we have here. Um, a pod that's running, and we're going to look at the CPU usage on the left. And you can see here, let's say a five minute graph of CPU usage. And let's say the limit here is half a CPU. And the pod is using 0 0.25 CPU. So it's far under the limit. No problem, everything is perfect. But this pod, it can have throttling. And it very often does have throttling. I see this all the time with people who use Prometheus or who use Robusta. And um, we'll show them the graphs to prove it, but like you can have throttling even when you're far below the limit. And the reason is, let's say we take care of this time period. We take care of the first 100 milliseconds, or we take 100 milliseconds in the middle, and we zoom in here on this usage, and we go in really, really close. And what you see when you zoom in is that it's actually bursty. And what you see happening is you see that the pod will do nothing for quite a bit of time. Then along comes, a CPU, along comes an HTTP request. And now you respond to the HTTP request. So you're on full gas. You start doing the stuff, and you're doing all this stuff, and you're running for a certain period of time. And then you get throttled. And then get throttled, you wait a while. And then later on, you have another request, or you finish handling that request. And you, again, you go and you run, and you do a bunch of stuff. The point is, it's bursty. So when you're looking at the average, on average, you can be using 0 0.25 CPU. But when you zoom in, it might be that you're using 100% of the CPU for a very short period of time, and then you're just waiting a really long time and doing nothing. And when I'm looking at these graphs, this is actually fairly simplified. There's a nuance here, which is that it's actually physically impossible to use half a CPU. Like if you think about it, there's a CPU, and either it's running your application or it's not running your application. There's no such thing as half a CPU. 
What's going on is you're using one CPU half the time. So I'm a little bit hand wavy here with my explanation. I'm not being completely precise, but the important thing to understand is that when you zoom in on this graph, then you see that there are actually bursts and you actually have a pod that's not on a constant 25%. You have a pod that's on 100%, then it gets throttled. It has to wait a whole long time. Then it can run again, it's on 100%. And then maybe it waits 10 minutes and does nothing because there's no HTTP request. So this explains a phenomena that you see all the time, which is that you have a pod that is using far less than the limits and it's still a CPU throttled. So this is why limits can be very harmful. And just to say one more word about this, like the symptom for this is that you have uh, typically good latency. And then when you look at the P99, the 99th percentile, then you see terrible, terrible latency because you have these long HTTP requests. They're getting throttled a lot in the middle. And the way to think about this is like you have, let's say, um, let's say you have a, a node and it has all this extra capacity. And then you have a pod that's running on there and in comes an HTTP request and you start running and you're running and you're doing with that request. And then bam, you hit your limit. So it's a hard stop. Now you're waiting, the node's doing nothing, but you have to wait, you have to wait, you have to wait. You have to wait until the next CPU period. You have to wait until the time passes and you can run again. And you're waiting there and you're doing nothing. And like, meanwhile, someone somewhere is like madly hitting refresh in their browser and they're waiting for the page to load. But now you're waiting and the node has extra CPU because no one's using it anyway, but you're waiting because if we zoom in on this time period, then like you used up your CPU quota and now you're waiting to get your CPU quota back again. So what happens is you have a lot of requests that are like, okay, because they're short enough that they just run in the allocated time slot. And then you have a bunch of requests that like run a little bit and then they get stopped. And then they wait a while and then they run a little bit more and they get stopped. And the P99, the 99th percentile is awful. So that's the symptom of this. And it's a fairly technical explanation. So I'm sorry if like that was a little bit fast or hand wavy. Um, I don't want to get into all the precise mathematics for that, but that's the gist of it. If anyone wants, then send me a message and I'll send you a more detailed explanation afterwards. Okay. So to zoom out now and to say, okay, explain that it's not just me here. I'm quoting here uh, one of the Kubernetes maintainers, Tim Hacken, who has also spoken a lot about this topic. And this is from a tweet of his. He says, I always advise set memory limit equals request. Nope, he's talking about memory, not CPU. And we will touch upon that in just another moment. And two, never set CPU limits. And he does give a caveat that like, you should never say never, but we'll also touch on that in a second. So it's not just me and you can find live stuff um, from companies I've written about this. I think the Zalando guys also had an incident with bad P99 latency, but it's sort of the well-known, the, the well-known secret of Kubernetes is that you really don't want to use them. It's all together. And now let's touch on some exceptions to that. So edge cases, I'll touch on three edge cases. One is performance testing. Let's say you're doing performance testing and you want to see how your application works with one CPU. Well, you don't want to give it two CPUs then. So like, yeah, set a limit and make sure it only gets one CPU when you're doing performance testing. Um, two, and this always comes up whenever I speak about Kubernetes uh, CPU limits and I say, get rid of your limits. Then someone says to me, what about on Windows? On Windows, things are a little bit different. That probably is true. I don't know enough about Windows nodes. I don't run Windows nodes personally. Um, but if you are running Kubernetes with Windows nodes, then ignore everything I said and do your own research. I'm not an authority on that. And the third edge case is a bit of a weird, unusual edge case, but one that I heard from a friend. And it goes like this. They're a company and they provide compute services to other people. And they provide a service that's related to machine learning and they have um, a vector database. So they can like take two vectors and they can calculate really quickly like the distance between them, which is useful for all sorts of stuff I don't understand. And they essentially say to their customers, okay, like you order from us and we'll give you, let's say five CPUs worth of compute capacity to our application, our service running on Kubernetes. And now a customer comes along and they purchase the equivalent of five CPU from the service. And the first thing they do is they go and they benchmark it. So let's say you had no limits. Then the customer comes and they benchmark it and they're promised five CPU, but maybe they get 10 CPU because on that day, no one else is using the CPU. So there weren't as many other customers around. So they got 10, C so they got 10 CPU when they only ordered five. So the customers threw all, they go, oh, the performance on this is excellent. And then next month, the customer does another benchmark. But on the day that they benchmark next month, other customers are using the service. So they don't get the full 10 anymore. Now they get no five. So this creates for you 
a customer relations problem because now the customer will say, oh, last month everything was running fine. Now there's a 50% like reduction in the performance that I'm getting something there's a degradation in your service. So this is one of those weird cases where like technically it's a pain, but you're better off throwing away the extra CPU and limiting stuff artificially rather than going and shooting yourself in the foot with the customer, but one day they have better performance than they're paying for. And then the other day they have just the performance that they did pay for, but it seems like there's a degradation. So, um, and I see a comment here from uh, Chet Hosey as well saying that that's occurred to him too. So yeah, this is like an annoying edge case, but when it happens, then like you have the situation, like, yeah, you're justified in setting limits. Uh, it's true. But if you're just running stuff in the same company and doing all that, like you really are better off giving the CPU to someone who needs it rather than throwing it away. Um, okay, so let's now speak about memory, which I've been getting asked about quite a bit. And misconception number three is that CPU and memory are the same. And like I, whenever I say CPU, the mayor CPU request, like you just replace the word CPU with memory, then all the guidelines are the same. That's wrong. They're fundamentally different. And the reason that CPU and memory are fundamentally different is because CPU is compressible. Compressible is a term you see in the Kubernetes documentation. And what it means is that he who giveth can taketh away. Or if you give something, you can take it away afterwards. And there isn't a big price for that. Um, and what that means is, let's say you have a pod who's running, which is running, and there's extra CPU in the node, and it wants the extra CPU, and it's available, and no one needs it. No problem. You give it the CPU. Now, some other pod wakes up and says, oh, I actually do want my request after all. Now I have work to do. Well, just because you gave someone CPU, there's no problem to take it away. Like, you're not actually taking it away. What you're doing is at any given moment, the Linux scheduler is looking and saying, who should run right now? So like before a moment ago, it decided that someone should run. Now it decides someone else should run. Like you're not really taking anything away. Sometimes people will say to me, well, like, how can you take back the CPU? Or like, didn't you use up the CPU on a different pod? Like you can't use up CPU unless you have a time machine. Like at any given moment, either you give someone that CPU or you don't give them the CPU. It's not like, it's not like you can travel back in time and use it for someone else. And like, if you gave it to someone else, that doesn't impact the future. Like you could just not give it to them next time. So um, just because you gave some a CPU doesn't mean that you can't take away the next moment. So the point is that because CPU is compressible, there's no problem with not having limits. That you can get rid of your limits because you give someone extra CPU and then you take it away from them if someone else needs it. Like, no problem. Just let everything work out with their requests. Memory is a totally different game. That's safe for memory, then you just let people use memory that wasn't being used by anyone else. Well, now you have a problem. Because you can't, in order to take that memory back away and to give it to the person who it belongs to, you have to go and you have to kill the first pot. Because once you give memory, someone has gone, they put stuff there in memory. It's like stored there. And they're going to want to access that. So you can't go and take that away anymore. Like the only way to take away is to kill the process. And in Kubernetes and Linux terms, it's an um kill, an out of memory kill, or an OOM kill. Um, it, so memory is fundamentally different. And it's so different. And there are so many nuances here. It really justifies an entire webinar an entire blog post or YouTube series, which I've been meaning to do just about memory. So if you're interested, then please send me a message and encourage me and you'll remind me to actually get around to doing it. But I'm not going to cover it here today. I'm just going to give the bottom line recommendation, uh, which was on this slide previously, this slide from Tim Hacken, just set the memory limit to the request. So for CPUs, then you just want to set the request. And for memory, you want to set a limit and the request. You want to make sure they're equal to one another. And I'm not going into all the details on this now because it really is a big topic that justifies a separate conversation. Okay, so I'm gonna go over my, like the bottom line, my recommendations, and then I'm gonna go over any remaining questions. And I think this is my last slide. Yeah, so I'm just gonna go over the recommendations and then we'll get to questions. So the bottom line is define a CPU request for everything. And this is important because if you don't give someone a CPU request, they're not promised any CPU. And again, you have all the limits you want in the world. You can do whatever you want with limits. If someone doesn't have a CPU request, they are not guaranteed a single thing. You will always, no matter what, only be guaranteed your request. And again, if you have all those limits, it's not going to help you like because the Kubernetes schedule will schedule you somewhere that gives you at least the request. And if your request is nothing, then you'll be scheduled somewhere where you're not guaranteed anything. So that's number one. Always give everything CPU requests. Now, assuming that you did that, assuming that you gave people somewhere accurate requests, 
and you did that for everyone, then never define limits. It's not going to help you. What you want is soft limits so that like, if you're not using CPU, then someone else can have it. And if you are using CPU, then you get it. And soft limits, that's just a request. Like in Kubernetes, a soft limit is a request. And a limit is a hard limit that can never be violated. So just don't define limits. And then if CPU is available, give it to whoever needs it instead of throwing it away, and everything is good. Um, three, monitor your request periodically and make sure that they're accurate. And there's a question, there's a parentheses there about beta. Um, we are trying to do some work in Robusta, which still isn't out yet. So um, if you're interested, then please talk to us and also check out the other solutions that were mentioned earlier for this. So that would be Goldilocks and uh, the VPA. And also just look at Grafana and like do the math yourself. Um, but we are trying to do a good way for that and to do something that will monitor it regularly. So feel free to contact me about that if you're interested in helping out with an open source project there. And four, for memory, always set request to limit and don't make it too low. And this I will hopefully try and elaborate on another point in time in the future. So that's it. And um, I'm going to go over some of the questions. So let's see. OK, so there's a question here. Multiple pods are using more CPU than requested. Is the administration and requested resources updated, or would future pods get scheduled on that node with the requested CPU and then get throttled unexpectedly after all? Um, in regarding memory, would such a situation lead to the um killer handling, handling this? So yes, with regard to memory, if you put if you put stuff on a node and you set requests and someone uses more than the request, um, you're going to get um killed. And when you get um killed, if it's right away or if it's at a slightly later point in time, depends on a lot of factors. I'm not going into it right now. Um, regarding CPU, and to just repeat the question one more time, the question is, does Kubernetes look at what's actually being used when it schedules? Or does it only look at the request? And it only looks at the request. When Kubernetes schedules, if we go all the way back and Kubernetes is taking these containers and scheduling it to the different nodes, and it's doing that according to um, the amount of capacity available and it's looking at your request and it's doing stuff that way, ignores the actual usage. The actual usage is not taken into account um, during scheduling. Um, then there's another question, I think, about Docker desktop and Rancher desktop, which I think someone else answered in the chat. Um, and we've spoken a little bit about memory limits, which was asked about. Um, so there's another question here. I had issues with memory going over requested, but below limit when everything was slowing down heavily. Well, kind of the only bad thing should be other memory killer if extra memory is not available. Uh, is that a memory nuance or, or the disk issue that was mentioned? So yeah, it could actually be a disk issue there. Um, you should say, if you're using, if you're digging into node allocatable, the short answer is you should set uh, request equal to limits. And if necessary, then you should update the node allocatable, the amount that's reserved for the node itself. And if you do those two things, it'll fix the issue. That does sound like disk uh, thrashing. And then Evgeny had two more questions. Um, is it guaranteed to get the physical CPU I requested when there's no CPU limits? Meaning if I request two CPUs, I get two vCores all the time without time limitation with CPU limits. So it's complicated because again, imagine that you're requesting, um, imagine that you're requesting like 0.5 CPU. You're not actually getting half the CPU, you're getting one CPU 50% of the time. But yeah, essentially you are guaranteed to get what you requested. So yes, you do get what you requested and that is reserved for you. Um, and if you don't have limits, then there's like slightly extra capacity available, then you can allocate it as well. So it helps even out those gaps in terms of scheduling periods. Um, and if getting added on for that, meaning um, worst case scenario, the app will work slower rather than be stopped. And um, just to elaborate a little bit more on what I just answered, then it's not, if you're requesting half a CPU, then you're not really getting half a CPU all the time, you're getting one CPU half the time. So it's tricky. Uh, that's the short answer. And then it seems uh, there's another question here. It seems like GKE autopilot, for instance, is, um, is a flawed concept. At GKE autopilot, your CPU request is equal to your limits. So you never get more. It, you pay full time for the CPU that you requested. Um, I'm not familiar enough with autopilot, so I, I'd rather not comment on this. 
Um, I'm going to pass on this one for now. You can follow up with me later on. I'm happy to take a look. I'm just not familiar enough with all the pilot to comfortably answer that. So next question, why set memory request equals limit? Um, and I'm going to cap out this one too, because I do want to address this separately. Um, or follow me offline. I'm just trying not to go too much into the memory stuff because it's really a whole nother uh, talk. Okay, then there's a great question here. How does your recommendation affect the concept of quality of service in Kubernetes? Does it obsolete the concept of a guarantee class? Yeah, guarantee is pretty much a lie. Um, it's the Kubernetes documentation on this is very tricky. And I'm just gonna show this. Um, I'll also explain this question for people who aren't as familiar with it. So there's this concept in Kubernetes called quality of service. And essentially Kubernetes splits up all your pods into three different classes, guaranteed, burstable, and best effort. And then these three quality of service classes are like supposed to represent how prioritized your pod is and all these different things. And then according to those, supposedly, then Kubernetes makes all these different decisions. And if you, in short, if you have no limit, sorry, if you have uh, no limit and no request in your best effort, if you have a request and no limit, which is exactly what I'm recommending here, then you're burstable. And if you have a request and a limit, you're guaranteed. So the question here is, I'm telling everyone that all your pods should be burstable and they shouldn't be guaranteed. So if you make all your pods burstable and you don't make them guaranteed, then are you now getting an inferior quality of service which is going to mess up all this other stuff. So let me find the right page on this. Um, it's always tricky to find. Kubernetes resource management. I'm gonna open up here, quality of service. I think they actually may have changed something here recently as they can. All right, so there's a page in the documentation which I can't seem to find right now. But I could have sworn I even had it open the other day. Yeah, okay, I'm not, I'm not finding this right now. But um, there's a page in the Kubernetes documentation which is very misleading. And the page in the Kubernetes documentation essentially implies that it's better to be guaranteed because that impacts who gets evicted off of nodes first. But when you read it really closely, then it doesn't actually say that. And maybe they actually updated the documentation and removed it. When you look really, really closely um, at the documentation, then actually burstable and guaranteed are dealt the same way. And what matters is if you're over your request or not. Um, so very briefly, it, it, it it doesn't have an impact, the impact that people necessarily think it has on quality of service. Um, it, does have, it does change your quality of service, but it doesn't do much. What quality of service does impact is if you don't have limits, then when Kubernetes comes around and starts unkilling stuff, if you have an issue with memory, then you are slightly more prioritized to be unkilled. And there are other ways you can fix that as well with priorities. Um, then there's a question there about Kubernetes shares and CFS. I'm not enough of a kernel expert to go into details on this. Uh, so um, best way is always just to read the kernel sources and then to like look at that and mold that for half a day and like go to the beach or go out to a bar and get a beer and then like look at it again. Um, so I'm, I can't give enough detail there. I remember by looking, from looking at it in the past and from like a kernel course in university that was fairly complicated. So I'm, I can't give, I'm not the right person to answer that. Um, and then another question to ask yourself, struggling with CPU limits, is micromanaging limits on Kubernetes cheaper than running um, and then causing a critical outage of business critical applications running Kubernetes? Generally, um, in the school of thought, uh, with zero defined limits. Um, yep, 100% true. Uh, another question, do you recommend using the same nodes to run, uh, to run pods of API, so latency sensitive and batch processing? So if other pods are using more than the request, not properly sized, an API would get only its request. I'm supposing the API is properly sized, uh, but it wouldn't be good enough for latency. Um, well, the, the API isn't properly sized, and if the API gets only its request, 
but it needs more than your two request, then you don't have the correct request. So either you have to up it or you have to split them into separate places, but that's it's a fundamental problem. And again, it comes back to whether you're going to be over utilized or under utilized, but it's kind of fun. Like there's a fundamental issue here in that you can't predict the future and CPU changes. So it is a, like, it's a law of nature that you can't get around. You want to be either overutilized or underutilized. So either you update your request or you do something inefficient, put them on a different node or whatever. But there's a law of nature here, which is that you can't predict the future. Okay, then a question from Scott. Does your recommendation also apply to Sky sidecar and init containers? Yeah, uh, same thing. And in turn, people don't realize this, but you actually define everything on the level of a container. Like people sometimes will speak about, um, about pods getting unkilled. And pod actually can't get unkilled technically only. In fact, the container can't even get unkilled. Technically only a process is unkilled. Um, maybe the container actually is in certain scenarios. Um, but yeah, everything here applies to sidecar and init containers as well. In fact, everything here to start with is really about containers and not about pods. Okay, then why is this stipulated time like a second in your half time? Um, I don't know, it's the kernel parameters, depends on your system. And then how can I figure out that my pod is wasting all its limits? Uh, pod is sometimes throttling when Grafana shows stable usage about one third of the limits. Can Prometheus scraping handle intervals lower than a second, even milliseconds? Yeah, there's a separate metric here. You can see it. I'm going to bring it up actually. Um, let me, I'm just going to bring it up actually from our GitHub. There's a question here how can you see if something is being throttled? So I'm just going to, from a little bit of a roundabout way, I know how to find it. Okay, so I'm looking here at Robusta where we like take various Prometheus alerts and then we add on extra data for them. And I'm just looking here for the throttling alert. So yeah, uh, the there is CPU throttling high in Prometheus if you use Q Prometheus stack. And let me bring up the definition for that. Um, and all these issues that you're gonna see about CPU throttling high, false positives and every pod in the system, all that has to do with limits. Um, if you get rid of your limits, you solve most of that. Um, I wanna find the exact metric Okay, so you can see the exact metric here. It's um, a container CPU CFS throttle periods. So there are various metrics here that you can use to actually see how much throttling occurs. So you want to see if you're being throttled or not, then don't look at your average CPU usage, just look at the throttling metrics. Um, and I'll, I'll plug robusta.dev here and I'll say if you install our Prometheus and our alerts, which just include uh, Cube Prometheus stack, where they add on like the extra enrichments and data on why it's happening, then if your CPU throttle will tell you and will tell you why it's happening. Like that's exactly what you're looking at here. We're saying that if your CPU throttle high, then like run this enricher that adds in like pulling the graph of CPU and pulling all this other stuff. And like when you get a message in stack, then we'll give you the context for why it's happening. Um, and then Nindison who's dropping, uh, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for the nice comments. Um, okay, so uh, one more question in the Q and A and then I'm going to just jump over to the chat and see if there's anything else there to answer. What is not setting a CPU limit? Does this mean it's infinite or it's zero? So you just get what you request. It means that it's infinite. So if you don't set a CPU limit, then it's infinite. And if you don't set a request by the way, then your request is equal to your limit. So it's actually impossible to not set a request and to set a limit. Could we know these steps and it sets the request to the limit? Okay, so looking over at the chat now, and I guess I might as well bring this on screen. Um, it, so thank you to everyone who said hello and thank you for everyone who participated um, into the call here from Scott on uh, Goldilocks. And then there's a question here, does Kubernetes kill a pod if it's using more than its limit, but there's still resources for other pod requests? With CPU, no. With uh, memory, then yes. Or sometimes it's complicated. It does kill you, but it's complicated when it kills you. Um, yes, this is exactly when I use CPU limits. Uh, yeah, there was a good comment there about chat, about customers who benchmark you. And there was a comment here also about setting it for tuning uh, stuff and performance testing is absolutely correct. And uh, Jin Hong, uh, thank you very much. I would love if you could update the Caverno policies. Um, I, I'd love to even get up once. I, I, I've applied for KubeCon a few times, actually to talk about various stuff and they always keep rejecting my talks. I don't think I applied to talk about CPU limits, maybe about other stuff, but I'd love to do that. And if you can update the Caverno policies, um, I think it would be incredibly useful and to really start getting better data out there to people and to really um, educate people on why, even though everyone thinks it's the best practice, it's actually very harmful. Then Oliver asked if I can post the GitHub uh, link for the beta stuff I mentioned. 
So it's not out yet. Like we're doing some product work around it and planning it out, like playing around with it a little bit internally. It's best to join us on our, uh, to message me on Slack. And I'm on the platform con Slack as well. Um, so it's best to message me and then I'll see. And um, we like to get feedback also on the design stage for how you would use that. Um, okay, thank you to everyone else. And uh, for Per, I'm happy to come and talk to your organization. Um, I'd be happy to do that. And um, hello again, Luca. Hi, Anita. I love I love when when the the webinar moderates itself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so thank you, thank you for um, a great talk. I think you know we'd literally just drop under hundred people <clears throat> because some people had to go to work, quote unquote, which is a very interesting way of defining it. Uh, but thank you. This was great. Um, as you said, you know you're in your Slack on the platform engineering Slack, so. We'll make sure to include the links and the recording and um, and you guys can find us on the Slack. So thank you, Nathan, again. It was great. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. See you in the next one. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me and making this possible. Like, I, yeah, great, it great. never would have happened if you hadn't reached out and said, let's do this. Like, I'm always happy to come and talk. But I have so much going on. I never have the time to, like, actually organize anything. So thank you very much. Yeah, for... maybe, maybe we should do another one. And you should definitely apply uh, with this one to KubeCon. Uh, maybe it's the right one. Yeah, yeah I mean, we'll send the recording and the resources tomorrow and then you